Hello and welcome to the Friday, April 5th, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storms and Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Thanks to everybody attending our webcast today. If you missed it, a link to the recording is up on the Internet Storm Center's homepage and I'll probably leave it up there for the weekend. As mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, it's really not so much about figuring out how to detect the current XC util backdoor, but really much more about how we are able to detect future issues like this now that we know what playbook the attacker used in order to infiltrate the XE Util project. In Diaries today, we have a great analysis of the Donex ransomware by John Mutas. He wrote a guest diary and is walking us through the reverse analysis using Binary Ninja. So real great if you are into reverse analysis yourself and uh, would like to sort of see a step-by-step walkthrough through the process uh, for uh, this particular sample. Now, Donex, in case you haven't heard about it, is the latest uh, reincarnation of Lockbit. Lockbit, of course, was sort of one of the somewhat successful takedowns for ransomware groups, but the source code had leaked and successors like Dark Race, for example, and now Donex have adopted that code and, well, as John shows here, have done little really to change it and uh, just sort of uh, readapted it, made it uh, pass some simple signatures so it's not as easily detected. But other than that, uh, very close still to the original Lockbit code. And then we have yet another denial of service attack against HTTP2. We just recently had the reset flood that I talked about. This time it's a continuation flood. When you're sending an HTTP request, you, as typical for HTTP, start with headers. If these headers exceed a single frame, you can add continuation frames. Now, each one of these continuation frames has a flag that tells you if there are more headers following. And that's a simple trick here. Reminds me a little bit of some of the fragmentation attacks where you just never send set the flag that indicates that the headers are all sent. That way you more or less send indefinite headers, which have to be stored in memory and can lead to a denial of service attack. Multiple name brand uh, implementations of HTTP2 are affected here. Apache, Tomcat, the Golang HTTP server, NGHTTP2, so pretty much uh, most of the web servers out there are vulnerable to this attack or were vulnerable before this attack was patched. Many of them have already been patched back in February, but now we have the details, how the attack worked and how to possibly launch it based on this blog post by Bartek Novortarsky. And then we have an interesting blog post by Lutra Security about what they call cobalt letters. The trick here is, well, yet again, style sheets in HTML emails. Now, it's a well-known issue that if you remote include an, a style sheet, an attacker could swap that style sheet out and with that change the appearance of the email. The interesting part here is that it's actually inline style sheets that are affected. And in this case, these style sheets are created in such a way that the content of the email, the displayed content, I should say, changes as the email is being forwarded. As you forward an HTML email, it's usually quoted in some form, which means that the DOM changes for the HTML in the email. And with that, different styles can be applied to the forwarded email versus the original email. In the simple example that they post as a proof of concept, essentially a second line in the email will only be visible in the forwarded version, not in the original version that the user saw initially. 
And well, it's Friday, and as sometimes on Friday, we do have another sans.edu student here talking about their research. With me here today is Dan Masella. Dan, could you introduce yourself, please? Absolutely. So my name is Dan Masella, and I'm a recent graduate of the Sans Technology Institute MSIC program. And currently, uh, I'm employed with the Cisco Talos Intelligence Group, and I'm a malware researcher for them. Yeah, and the malware you actually looked at in your paper is kind of really cutting edge and interesting. Info stealers in automotive head units. Of course, you know, car hacking is sort of a hot topic. And uh, what you really found there is some you know, real threats. And I think you know, what I liked about the paper is there's some real experiments where you actually check you know, what can be gathered there. Can you sort of summarize a little bit sort of the architecture, sort of the overall big picture, what you looked at? So my interest was very much in okay, we don't really see too much malware infecting cars. And for the most part, car research is focused on consumer safety, and rightfully so. But I kind of wanted to look more at, okay, what data is really present on automotive head units? What about a consumer can I get at? And financially motivated threat actors are always looking for new targets, and especially information stealing malware, uh, very common nowadays, and we see it growing exponentially, especially with ransomware attacks. So I wanted to kind of see, well, is a car a viable target for information stealing malware? Could financially motivated threat actors target these types of uh, Internet of Things devices? And how would they do so? What are some common techniques we're seeing in the wild that may be kind of transferable to a car? So that's really where I wanted to focus my research. Yeah, so all the information kind of stored in the car. And uh, I myself have two cars. One is of the older type. It has a head unit, but it doesn't really do much. The newer one sort of does the full, you know, Apple CarPlay and such. I think that's what you're looking at. Or how much data from my phone, which really has all my data, is actually ending up sort of in the car in these head units. There's a lot of data, not just coming from your phone, but also if you log into third-party applications on the head unit, a lot of head units nowadays are moving towards Android Automotive OS, which has all different kinds of Google integrations, uh, different third-party applications. So when you sync your data to your head unit, you're getting a lot of data that you may not even realize should be there. And actually, a very interesting finding from the Mozilla foundation last year was that cars are one of the worst reviewed IoT devices in terms of privacy. And there's a lot more data there than you may actually uh, realize. Yeah, so I think just last week, I read something about that uh, car manufacturers are now sharing some of the information with insurances uh, to essentially, you know, rate your driving and uh, adjust your insurance rate or the risk that uh, your insurance. And is that the kind of data that you looked at? Or is there uh, anything else that I looked way more at the kind of traditional data you would think of, you know, um, data from your phone in terms of SMS messaging. Uh, Is there credit card data? How might that get on your head unit? And any other data of interest, including your exact latitude, longitude. Um, So this kind of goes beyond the scope of what I was looking at, uh, particularly with information stealing. But even if you look at more spyware type things and, you know, in tracking and stalkerware, there's a lot of opportunity for attackers that, you know, can go after that specific type of data that may not even realize is actually on your car. Is there a sort of a business reason for it? I can see the GPS data, I know, for navigation and such. But uh, why does this head unit have access to your SMS messages or credit card data? Or is it really just sloppy coding where they just take whatever there is? Well, I would say a lot of it is because it's convenience for the consumer. So if I'm a consumer and I want to, you know, use my credit card on the head unit for one reason or another, uh, Google Chrome on the head unit, which nowadays you'll find on um, Android automotive OS head units, you can sync your Chrome data, which will include autofill for credit card data, which you may not have even realized, wow, that can now pop up on my head unit as well. And any other thing, including uh, your name, your address, and SMS messaging, Uh, and this was one of the more fun parts of the experiment, was looking at how Bluetooth can be used to extract all sorts of data, including your entire call history, all of your SMS messaging, 
And with the correct permissions being allowed to the head unit over Bluetooth, the head unit can actually download all of your SMS mess- uh, messages, including you know text, photos, who you sent them to, when you sent them. And a lot of this is simply for convenience because consumers want the ability to see their text messages on the head unit, to be able to read them, even though uh, Google's really kind of pushing back. And you see that with Android Auto and even with Apple CarPlay, they're very much trying to restrict the driver from being able to read messages. So if you use those services, which is more streaming what's on your phone to the car rather than actually having the data sit on the head unit itself, what you actually see is there's not a lot of that data going to the head unit because they want to only have messages that you're receiving while you drive pop up and be read to you while you drive. So not only is it safer, but from a data privacy perspective, it's actually safer for your data. Yeah. So basically minimizing the exposure there. Uh, you mentioned Bluetooth. Uh, how would an attacker you now gain access to the data? Uh, do they have to break your car and attach USB cables to your head unit or to the uh, diagnosis port? Or uh, are there some wireless and remote ways of doing that? Well, there's a number of different ways. And if you look at autonomous, semi-autonomous vehicles, and a lot of vehicles nowadays are actually having um, integrations so that they can access cell phone towers directly. My research. I kind of wanted to focus more on what are the most common vehicles on the road today. And not every vehicle has access to cell phone tower, internet. So what I focused more on was how would I, as a financially motivated threat actor, hit the average head unit? And so I decided to go by a very popular technique, which we've seen with actors such as Fin7, um, do a bad USB attack. So I have my APK payload because it is an Android tablet. I put it on a USB stick and then I just have a ducky script run when you plug it into the head unit. And I was able to deliver the payload and through a little bit of social engineering, you could very easily convince a consumer to, hey, this is an update for your head unit. This is from your manufacturer at X car company, please install. Or you could look at this from a valet attack perspective or you know someone just breaking into vehicles. So it would be fairly targeted from that perspective. But snail mail USB attacks are more common than a lot of people realize. And we have seen threat actors do this in the past. Is there a possibility that a compromised phone will then infect the head unit as it's being connected? Absolutely. I think there's definitely a lot of opportunity for head units to be infected in that way. And I was able to even see vice versa, that if a phone is connected to the head unit, um, through very little social engineering, I could probably convince a user to download the APK and transfer the file from the head unit to the phone. Yeah, yeah you could kind of make this like an interesting application or like you know, the, the latest speed radar application update or something like that. Would this be sort of how you would do that? Yeah, or even... Even simpler, this is a compatibility app that your head unit requires to function properly. Please download on your phone so that we can properly sync the data and communicate with your phone to the head unit. That sounds really scary and actually uh, really something that probably I would fall for because that's sort of the kind of update that you would expect uh, kind of from a car. Yeah, uh, yeah that's uh, that's real great work there. Uh, I'll add a link to your paper in the show notes. So if anybody wants to read more about it, I think the experiments that you did are real great, sort of how you demonstrated uh, some of these risks, not just really speculating about them, but actually experimenting with them. Uh, Any final words here? Uh, If you all go back to carts and horses or uh, any easy way to protect yourself here? The end of the day, it's simply if you're, Plugging your phone or connecting your phone to a car that you do not trust, so say a rental car, I wouldn't say don't connect it at all, but be sure to restrict the data you share over Bluetooth. Be sure to not log into any third-party applications on the head unit. It's just not worth the risk to your data. And I strongly encourage the use of things like CarPlay and Android Auto. Um, Those very much restrict what data gets transferred. And it's not only safer, as I mentioned, for your data, it's safer for you as a driver. Yeah, thank you. Thanks uh, for joining me here. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. 
And that's it for today. Next week, I'll actually be in London and we also have a community night coming up. Check the Sands website for any details in case you would like to attend. That's it. And talk to you again on Monday. Bye.